Hello, I'm Michael Serapio. On February the 24th, 2022, the Russian President Vladimir Putin sent upwards of 200,000 troops into Ukraine, launching an illegal war and the largest invasion in European history since the Second World War. The goal was to capture the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, and overthrow the government of Vladimir Zelensky in what the Kremlin believed would be a matter of weeks, if not days. But Ukraine rallied, civilians and soldiers alike standing up against Russian aggression to protect Ukrainian territory. The cost has been great. Tens of thousands have been killed and injured. There are multiple reports from Ukrainian survivors sharing stories of being raped and witnessing indiscriminate killings at the hands of Russian soldiers. The invasion and fighting have also, according to the UNHCR, displaced millions of Ukrainian people, both inside and outside the country. Recently, I sat down with Ukraine's ambassador to Canada, Yulia Kovalev, and during our conversation, she shared her personal reflections on the war and the resolve of her people to deny Vladimir Putin a victory in Ukraine. I wanted to begin with the first day of the war, and if you don't mind, I want to ask you to share with us what it was like, where you were, what you were feeling when the, the first images of the Russian invasion started being shared with news outlets around the world. Actually, me and my family, we were in Ukraine when the war started. So it was early in the morning when we woke up uh, uh, just hearing the sounds, the, the, you know, the very strong sounds of explosion near us. And uh, then the, the next second, the message I got on my phone, it was the war started. And that was the, the message I will never forget in my life because that's where you realize in this very first seconds that this will be a big fight for my country. And the, of course, the, another emotion is to think about uh, our children, um, their safety, and the safety of our family. So the first call I made, this was the call to my parents, asking where are they and whether they are okay. And then in a few hours, I think, you know, the feeling was that all, the, all Ukraine will t turn out to two groups. Uh, the first group were men and women who were taking the line uh, as the volunteers to join the Ukraine uh, defense and Ukraine territorial defense. And the second part of the country in one second turned out to be the volunteers. Uh, we got many uh, groups in all of possible messengers uh, coordinating a lot of efforts just to support uh, the humanitarian needs. And this was uh, for the first days and weeks, um, the uh, biggest unity and the response of, of Ukrainians itself uh, on helping those who were evacuating uh, from, uh, from suburbs of Kyiv where Russian tanks were uh, going there, trying to help the, uh, with everything, starting from food, medicine, clothes, uh, all of us were trying to find the vests, the helmets uh, for these new volunteers that joined the territorial defense. And it was the unity between, uh, you know, Ukrainians who were previously lawyers, doctors, journalists, IT people, uh, div engineers. Everybody was, I think, the mixture of either one group or another. Mm -hmm. it, people stepping forward. And, and here you were, even before you were an ambassador or appointed to, to, the, uh, to be ambassador, you were a public servant in Ukraine. So I can imagine there's the one hat that you wear as a public servant, but the other uh, as a daughter and as a mother to two children. How was it like to navigate those emotions and those fears as the war began? There was, I had a very personal um, story of my children before the war. It was a, probably a week before the war. And um, many friends of my daughter were coming to our home and uh, many of them already moved to Kyiv from occupied Donetsk and occupied Lugansk. And there's now 13 year old girls who were sharing their personal stories from 2014. 
how they um, how they you know met the Russian missiles hitting the the cities and how they were rushing evacuating with their parents uh, with just one suitcase to Kiev and how they since 2014 were building the new life in Kiev uh, and uh, because the um, the information about the potential invasion was in the air and I still remember the call of their kids they they want to they don't want to live another time uh, this experience and for them one more time finding a new home uh, that will be very hard mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and unfortunately many of those children now are around the world uh, the, their parents are finding the safe place for them uh, until the end of the war. Uh, but since, you know, my daughter is still talking and uh, uh, to them very often, the first thing that the children share between them, they, that they want to come back home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understandably. When the invasion began, several Ukrainian mili military targets were hit by Russian forces. Were you ever worried? Did you ever fear that Ukraine would not have the ability to hold off the offensive? I think that was um, that was not something that we as Ukrainians afraid uh, and were afraid because we understood, you know, what is the spirit of us as a country, how resilient we were, and we also have our history both in, from 2014 from Russian illegal occupation of Crimea, from invasion in Donetsk and Lugansk. And we have been building uh, our military capability, also with support here by uh, Canadian government who supported for years the training of Ukrainian soldiers um, by the Unifier program. And uh, for us, that was something obvious that Ukraine will withstand and Ukraine will resist and Ukrainians will, ha will have the spirit. I think it was for some of the countries, it was a, more a surprise because many of the countries still doubted whether Ukraine will be able to resist Russian full-scale invasion. Some of them, you know, said that Ukraine probably will fall down in a day or four days or a week. We are today almost a year of the full-scale invasion and Ukraine is not only able to resist the aggression but Ukraine is able to go counteroffensive and to liberate the territories. But the war has of course cost Ukraine not just in dollar amounts but, but in sheer destruction. When you see uh, cities like Mariupol, uh, Kherson reduced to rubble I'm wondering what that evokes in you. Does that make you sad? Does that make you angry? Of course, that that is not only the destroyed buildings, because the building you can, it's not so hard to rebuild the building. It's much harder to rebuild the home, but it's important to uh, bring back the lives of people. And this is the biggest value for us as the country, the value of those people who lost their lives, um, and many civilians. Just if we, if we remember just few weeks ago in Dnipro, the Russian missile hit the residential building, totally destroyed uh, and 46 innocent civilian people who were spending time with their families has been killed in this tragedy. And I think this, this is the biggest uh, price what we as Ukraine is paying, uh, protecting not only our country, but protecting democracy as an institution and protecting um, the human rights and, and in a broader sense, protecting the values that we all share. Mm -hmm. you, you talk about that missile strike and, and I can't help but think about the, uh, the missile strikes on the maternity ward in Mariupol, the, the countless lives that were taken in, in Bucha, these atrocities that human rights groups and the United Nations points to. Do you fear that people around the world are already forgetting those atrocities happened? No. And uh, the sad thing uh, of this is that Russia, by its atrocities, by its another attacks, is uh, reminding people. 
of what is happening in Ukraine. Uh, we all remember Bucha uh, after liberation. We saw the massive graves, we saw the um, sexual crimes, uh, killings, looting. So Russian sol soldiers were just looting the, um, you know, kitchen appliances from the house. We saw the massive graves in um, um, near Izum uh, after uh, we liberated the Kherson uh, region. Mariupol, I think when, when we will liberate Mariupol, the pictures there of the 450,000 population city totally scratched to the ground. That will be, I think, another reminder uh, of all of us that uh, the victory of Ukraine is also important to bring the justice to all of those people who died, who have been tortured. And uh, unfortunately, Russia is still committing those crimes. Even as we are talking with uh, you today, today there was 71 missile uh, that hit uh, uh, across uh, 61 of them has been um, destroyed by our air defense system, but still some of them hit the uh, energy infrastructure. And it, the energy infrastructure is something that provides all of us the basic needs, electricity, water, heating, mobile connection, which is also very important uh, when you're in the country w w which is fighting the war. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ukrainian president ha has spent uh, much time speaking to the Western allies, asking for arms. Canada has provided Ukraine uh, leopard tanks and a missile defense system, uh, as well as armored vehicles. How important are those military aids to Ukraine in this war? It's crucial. It's crucial because it gives us uh, the possibility to resist on the front line. Because Russia uh, was preparing for the war. Russia was said to be uh, the second biggest military power in the world. And that is important that, I think the important message what the world has already realized, that strategically Russia has already lost in this war was all of their so-called power and capability, we are resisting already a year, and we have been able to uh, liberate the areas to go into counteroffensive operations. All this is possible uh, with the military support that Ukraine is getting, whether it's the air defense, whether it's tanks, whether it's uh, armored vehicles, whether it's the uh, drones, whether it's the ammunition, uh, artillery. There is a, a, a huge number of uh, different military support that uh, countries are sending to us and including Canada. And it allows our soldiers on the front line to protect the country. And uh, it's also supporting us with training the people. It's very important because uh, this is where they have been trained by NATO standards. They uh, have been trained to use these new weapons. And that's where the, our Ukrainian capability to, to withstand the Russian aggression is building. Mm -hmm. You talk about NATO standards and the Western allies have stepped forward with military aid, but they have stopped short of admitting Ukraine to NATO. Does that frustrate you? Uh, what actually um, is happening now? On, in reality, Ukraine is already using NATO standard weapons. Ukraine is, is already, and Ukrainian soldiers are trained, are being trained, whether it's in UK with the joint program uh, with Canada or in other countries, they have been trained with the NATO standard weapons. And even during the war, Ukraine defense sector is being reformed and we already developed a, an action plan. Uh, what, what are the other needed institutional changes to also be in line with the NATO standards? So of course, when the war ends, um, this will be, I think, mutually beneficial both for Ukraine being um, um, a NATO member and also for NATO having Ukraine as a strong ally uh, that is fighting for, for the European security. Mm -hmm. And it's not just NATO. Uh, we've heard it from President Zelensky. Uh, the, the desire is that Ukraine 
will also be a part of the European Union. A and he makes the argument that Ukraine, and you said it yourself, is not just fighting for Ukraine, it's also fighting for European values. For people who've heard that but don't understand the sentiment, can you explain uh, the, the, the reasoning, the thinking behind that statement? We saw from the very first days of invasion uh, the huge support of many European countries, and especially the, the support of people, whether it's Poland, whether it's UK, whether it's Germany that hosted now uh, around one million of, uh, of Ukrainians, and many other, Czech Republic, Slovakia. So everybody was opening the door to Ukraine. And everybody was supporting Ukraine, whether it's the, the humanitarian appeal or going to rallies or advocating to their governments and parliaments to stand firmly with Ukraine. And I think, you know, in terms of going through all of this pain, uh, which the war brought to Ukrainian land, but also this war brought a lot of challenges to, to European countries, going together hand in hand through this pain, it's actually building uh, the relations with Ukraine much deeper than the relations between EU member countries and Ukraine as a candidate. It's building the, this relations as real partners, as real friends. As you heard in my conversation with the ambassador, the war in Ukraine has decimated cities and torn families apart. For most Ukrainians, life now is a tale of what existed before the invasion and what exists after. To highlight what that means, the Ukrainian embassy did host a photo exhibit to mark the one-year anniversary of Russia's illegal invasion, something I spoke about with Ambassador Kovalev. One is the, the exhibit of the uh, photographs from, uh, from the war that will show uh, the war and Ukrainian resistance from the different angles whether it's the, the atrocities what Russia committed uh, uh, in Ukraine, whether it's uh, the uh, showing how Russia was attacking precisely the Ukrainian agri-sector, uh, the grain storage is just burning the fields uh, uh, with the grains in time when the world and many countries around the globe, especially in Global South, uh, were in demand of Ukrainian grain. Uh, whether it's the strikes on the electricity infrastructure, uh, whether it's uh, the risk uh, uh, and uh, on the nuclear power plant. So we want to, to show the war was this different dimensions what you usually uh, read in the news, you watch in the media, but you know, this is the visual thing. And just Ukrainians and Ukrainian soldiers um, the ones who, for example, are traveling from the front line back home for several days and bringing their pets with them, because it's also a part of being human. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, the partnership and the response to the humanitarian need in, in Ukraine, and it makes me think of Ukrainians who've had to leave their country to seek refuge for themselves, for their children, uh, in countries not, through, not just through Europe, but here in Canada as well. From the thousands of Ukrainians who are now in Canada, what stories are they sharing with you? Uh, Canada, uh, for many decades, have a very special heart uh, in, to, to all of you Ukrainians because it's more than, you know, it's more than the allies and partners. This is the real friendship that has been built for over 150 years when first Ukrainians were coming to Canada. Then it was the First World War, then it was the Second World War, when, when many of Ukrainians were moving to Canada and the big Ukrainian community, which is uh, here in Canada, many of their parents, grandparents, came here um, just to find the safe place during the wars. And of course, and many other uh, like European communities. And of course, they understand, they share the, uh, the emotions and the feelings of the people who are coming now uh, in Canada, to Canada from, from Ukraine. Uh, we have approximately 150,000 of Ukrainians who, um, who use the special program QUIET, which was uh, um, offered by Canadian government as a speed uh, way to get the Canadian visas to Ukrainians. And we do appreciate uh, that 
uh, that decision of Canadian government. Uh, and uh, of course, they, they film very warm in Canada. Uh, not only because um, there is a big Ukrainian community and there is a big support both from, uh, from the government through the program, uh, but also uh, they feel a big support from Canadian people. And there are multiple stories when Ukrainian mothers with children uh, have been hosted by Canadian families who opened their doors for them, who provided them a bit of guidance, a bit of support learn, learning language and how to accommodate children at school, how to find uh, the job. And we do value the support. And that is really, I think, what, what will stay between our countries and between our people, this all personal stories, this open heartness of Canadian people, this will be in the history of our countries for centuries ahead. Mm. What does it mean then for people who are still in Ukraine to have members of Canadian government, of parliament, uh, show up to the country? For example, uh, the defense minister, the foreign affairs minister, the, the prime minister when the Canadian embassy was reopened in, in Kyiv. How important is that for the Ukrainian people? Um, it's very important for Ukrainian people because it shows the, the solidarity uh, with Ukraine. Uh, and the visits of the leaders uh, of the countries, and uh, uh, there was a visit of Prime Minister Trudeau, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Minister of uh, Defense, Minister of International Development. All these visits show also the, the support to Ukrainian people. And, and of course, it's the opportunity between the leaders, if we are talking about the visit of Prime Minister Trudeau with President Zelensky, to have this eye-to-eye -eye conversations, which is always um, you know, very special in the relations between the countries, between the leaders. Um, we have a very intensive dialogue now. President Zelensky and Prime Minister Trudeau had around 20 of phone calls uh, since February 24th, and I think that this the speed is, um, it's, the, the, the figure and the number is, is, is really big. The ministers are talking uh, very regularly. But also it's, it's showing the, the, the support of Ukrainians. And one important thing, it's also for many leaders who are coming Ukraine, uh, to Ukraine, that's also a um, chance to see what is the war and how it is to people to live through the wartime. And, you know, to feel this um, importance of stepping in, supporting, and that I think uh, it's also, you know, not only valuable for Ukraine, but I think it brings more understanding uh, how important it is both for Ukraine to win this war and the message that Ukraine's victory will send to many other countries. I wonder about your own family in Ukraine. How are they? What has the war done to their lives? Um, my family is in Ukraine, and uh, today I spoke to them already three times. The first time it was around 2.30 a.m. in the morning, Canadian time. Uh, that was the first uh, 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 si signals of the uh, Siren, which usually signals of a potential missile attack uh, throughout the country and particularly in the place where they live. Um, the same happened several hours after. Uh, and that is, uh, that is hard uh, to live through that because, of course, I'm worried uh, about them. Uh, but uh, this is kind of this Ukrainian resilience. They keep on working. They keep on... Uh, helping the country to, to do the job what, what they can by paying taxes, by working on, on, on the companies where they work. Uh, I was at home almost a month ago at the, at the end of December, and uh, what I brought back with me uh, was not only the, the strengths of Ukrainians, but also um, a special uh, sound, how, if you can ask me how Ukraine sounds now, there is a special sound how I would say Ukraine sound.
This is the either the sound of the ceiling or the sound of working diesel generators. Because in order to survive, many of the people are just using them. And if you go on uh, through the streets of whether it's Kiev or the cities on the western part of Ukraine or eastern part of Ukraine, um, instead of hearing music, instead of hearing the sound of much traffic, you're hearing the sound of many diesel generators working and uh, producing electricity for those resilient hubs, whether it's the ambulances, whether it's some points of social serv services, or the small stores or the small uh, uh, coffee shops. It is now the, the new sound how, how, how I feel now the, the, the people of Ukraine trying to, uh, to go through, through this uh, horrific times. Mm -hmm. Is it frustrating then? I, and I appreciate you have an important job here in Ottawa, but is it frustrating not to be in Ukraine as the country continues to fight for its survival? It's a big honor for me to represent my country in the most important time for in our modern history. And it's also a big responsibility to, to do what, what could be best and even more uh, to both mobilize the, the support to Ukraine and help us to, to win this war and to build strong relations between our countries. They are strong and you know, it's, uh, it's my honor and privilege to, to work in Canada, the country who, who is really our strong friend, our strong ally, um, the country who from the very first days when the invasion started was standing firmly with Ukraine and solidarity with Ukraine and also to support the big Ukrainian community we have uh, here in Canada, both the one that lives for generations in Canada, but also uh, the newcomers to, to the country. And of course, when I'm trying to, to reach my family, uh, especially when it was the, the situation of the, the missile attacks and they are not answering for 30, 40 minutes, of course, as a, as a human being, my first reaction is trying to find the, you know, uh, the earliest tickets uh, home just to check whether they are okay. And uh, I'm praying every day for, for them and for all Ukrainians. That was Ukraine's ambassador to Canada, Yulia Kovalev, speaking with us at the Ukrainian embassy in Ottawa. I'm Michael Serapio. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again on the next Profile. Yeah. <laughs>